Good morning. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living in Redding, California. I'm Charlie Bourne, practitioner for today's service. Uh, Reverend Sue Miller Bourne will be doing uh, our talk, and we're joined by our sound team and our wonderful musicians, Judy and Dalton. And to start today's service, we're going to have an opening song by Dalton. Dalton? This is here, this is now, this is what it's all about. This is now, this is here, and it's very clear, I can feel my life. From this point in time, I can see my past. From this point in time, and I know the way is to make this moment shine. Here now, to make this moment shine. This is here, this is now, this is what it's all about. This is now, this is here, and it's very clear. I can feel my life. From this point in time, I can see my past. From this point in time, and I know the way is to make this moment shine. Here and now, to make this moment shine. Oh, here and now We'll make this moment shine What a beautiful opening. Thank you, Dalton. So it is a beautiful day. I hear the birds singing. I hear laughter in the air. And I'm reminded that we are in a very special place on this planet. And it is a special time as we move through the pandemic and we move to the other side and we also allow our hearts to be open and soft and loving at the same time. So I'm going to open with a few uh, invitations and then we're going to move into uh, a reading by Dalton and the invitation of the bell and then I'll do a a prayer, and then we'll have our talk by Reverend Sue with the topic, A Clean Slate. So to start off, uh, we will be uh, reopening on a limited basis. We're going to go to the 25% uh, level with uh, social distancing and the requirement of a mask. We'll have all the doors open in the sanctuary. And we're going to be announcing those specifics uh, later this week, so check our website and if you don't get our weekly update by email you know you can contact the office and you can sign up for that and you'll get more of those details but that's going to be happening very soon so we next sunday on uh, valentine's day we're going to have a a parking lot drive through and bake sale and so this is a valentine's day uh, from 11 a.m to noon so you'll have a chance to browse a table of fresh baked goodies and purchase a Valentine's suite for your special someone. So as we celebrate this community during this drive-through, 
you'll be able to kind of see some faces <laughs> and uh, wave to people uh, at your own level of uh, comfort and protection. But we'll have non-perishable, and we'll also be collecting non-perishable food items, uh, pet food for the homeless, jewelry for an upcoming spring marketplace fundraiser. And so if you need any details about um, if you want to help donate towards the bake sale giving, you can contact Reverend Sue through her email or, or cell phone and she can give you those details. The Sacred Sisters will be tomorrow night, Monday, exploring Daughters of Light with Reverend Sue Miller Bourne, uh, 7 to 8.30 p.m. online and via Zoom. Uh, so we're going to dialogue about what it means to be a daughter of light as personified in the energy of Sophia. The men's group will be tomorrow night uh, as well on Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. via Zoom with uh, Roy Wolfstead. So it's, it's going to be centered around more discussions and creating friendship among men in this community. Next we have uh, the calling, the call of challenging times. It's a workshop with Greg Lavoie. Some, many of you may be familiar with Greg Lavoie, but that'll be Sunday, February 1st. It's a workshop from noon to 3 p.m. Actually, it's going to be February 21st, so that's uh, two weeks away. <clears throat> so um, 3 p.m. online via Zoom. So join Greg and to explore how your own life and work might grow and evolve as a result of these uncertain and opportune times. And <clears throat> Having heard Greg before, I know that he's very passionate, he's very wise, and also very fun in his presentation. So be sure and check that out. Uh, you can check with the office in terms of being able, or on our website for signing up. And then we have Pilgrimage of the Spirit, a one-day retreat with Reverend Sue Miller-Born and uh, Dr. Andrea Golden uh, Azebito. So that's Saturday, February 27th, uh, from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. So that's going to be uh, <clears throat> via Zoom. So if you want to join Reverend Sue Millerborn and Andrea Azebito, <laughs> uh, this is open to everyone. There is a pre-registration -re requirement. <clears throat> and uh, so it's going to be joining with the Bellingham community as well on this Zoom workshop. And Reverend Sue has uh, a lot more details about that if you want to uh, contact her. So those are our announcements and invitations. And so now I'd like to invite Dalton up for today's reading. Good morning. Uh, this morning's reading comes from the Zen book by Daniel Levin. At a certain monastery, the monks noticed that one of the brothers was stealing from the others. As everyone had so little already, they went to the head of the temple and told him of the incident. The abbot said that he'd handle it and sent them off. The next day, it happened again. This time, the abbot told his monks, look what his brother has done excuse me, look what this brother has done to your hearts. He's stolen from you because he doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. But you, my monks, the ones who have cleansed and purified yourselves all these years, come to me with hearts full of anger at the injustice you've witnessed. If he weren't here, we would have to look for him and beg him to be a part of this monastery, for he's uncovered something in you that has long been hidden. Go now and release your anger into the acceptance of all beings. Please join with me in knowing that there is just one spirit, one love, one God, one divine presence that's everywhere present, fully available and open to everyone, each and every one, 
in its own unique way, but embracing all the aspects and the qualities of, of God. And so as I allow myself to delve into that recognition and that acceptance, I'm reminded of the beauty, the beauty that exists in nature by listening to the birds and the smell of flowers starting to want to burst open, the beauty of the mountains. And I also know that this beauty and this uh, joy exists deep within my heart. And so I allow this joy and this sense of peace to soften, to soften who I am and how I am in this world. I allow an opening and a receptivity to be at one with all, to be able to listen and to have a reset as we move forward in this time. So I know that there's love and it exists within each and every one of us at the depths of our soul and in our being. It is our birthright. And so today I allow myself to be open and receptive to the words of Reverend Sue as she speaks her heart and her understanding and her knowledge about today's topic, the topic of a clean slate. So I know with great love and great thanks, I'm thankful for today and for this service and for this community. And so I allow this to be true as we allow it to be released into the universe and fully accepted and together we say, and so it is. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Charlie. I want to wish everybody that has a February birthday a, a blessed month and celebrating yourself. One person that you all might know is, is Dr. Andrea. It was her birthday earlier this week. And uh, it's what uh, Lindy and I did last Sunday was pre-recorded a message so Andrea could have a, uh, a weekend off. And she asked if I would... Uh, speak for her, and of course I didn't want to travel up there, um, do the same thing, her church is closed as well. But it was sort of funny, because we did it, Lindy and I sent it off last, last Sunday. <laughs> but I woke up in the middle of the night kind of with butterflies about that, like, well this is a weird time warp. <laughs> why, am I, why am I nervous now? We already did it, and, and that doesn't happen until 10.30. And then it's just a, a reminder of stay present stay present and uh, be with what is. And that's where we start our message today. I appreciate uh, Dalton's reading of that little Zen tale. And I invite you to really soul search the, the message behind that small tale of, of the monks and the abbot and the person stealing. What we are talking about today is a blank slate and it reminded me years ago, uh, it was real popular to talk about um, the spiritual do-overs. If we had that opportunity just to, to revisit uh, one of our own personal misgivings and have a do-over, how free that would be. But this is on a deeper level as I approach it today. And I understand as, as I was looking at the different ideas around a clean slate, that this is one of the most powerful precepts of the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous movement, this, this blank slate, this clean slate. And so the, some of the words that I start to share with you come from Cindy Grimes, who contributed the, part of this message to the CSL community. And I share some of her words here because they're very succinct. She says, because we are not bound by precedent, but freed by principle, we are readily able to surrender form, to experience and embody spirit directly. We enter into a mode of deconstruction where the all is ever present, and yet the ways in which we experience it are done in new and meaningful ways. 
She reminds us of the CSL vision statement that we envision humanity awakening to its spiritual magnificence and discovering the creative power of thought. To awaken to that spiritual magnificence, we begin by cultivating self-awareness, which we talk about all the time, and self-reflection is the only way it's the only way to enter into that understanding. Consider establishing a routine of examining your beliefs, your behaviors, to determine whether or not they still serve you. In other words, create this clean slate in your own mind and ask yourself these questions. Where did this idea originate? Am I living in integrity with my values? Have I evolved with my values? Who would I be without this belief, this fear, or this behavior? And as detrimental beliefs are removed from consciousness, there is clarity and space for new possibilities to emerge. I just love that, um, that opening because those questions are very powerful, very pertinent to today's times. Now, something I was drawn to recently, I go through my bookshelves and I, I have... Um, quite an extensive library, and there was one that just, I thought, I've never really looked at this attitudinal healing. I remember it being very popular in the 1990s. And Susan Trout wrote this book, To See Differently, and I, I opened it up, and all there was a lot of highlighting. It was all pink highlighting, but one little phrase was stood out, bold, and green. She had taken all this pink and put this green uh, felt pen across these words. Forgiveness is your peace. And sometimes it's one of those moments where your awe just expands into this recollection of your own heart suffering, where you've been stuck, what that would feel like in the absolute peace that deep peace, and then I, it brought up the areas where in the corners of my being I had stuffed my areas of not wanting to really deal with it, kind of wanting the, the characters involved with my levels of unforgiveness to still be at fault, and if I let it go completely, that meant that I didn't have that story anymore, but it would bring me such peace. I don't know why that little green highlighted phrase changed my whole week. Forgiveness is your peace. Viktor Frankl also, when he said the choice, because it takes a choice to want to go into that level of forgiveness. Remember, Viktor Frankl saying the last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's way, to choose, to choose forgiveness. Now, there is great spiritual work before each and every one of us, this opportunity to soul search deep into our own being and heal the attitudes that we have buried. They seem to be out of reach of our conscious knowing, but they bubble up through our dreams. They bubble up through moments of being triggered. And here is an opportunity with all that's gone on in this past year, these times of being pulled out of our norm, and spending many times by ourselves to realize um, what is mine to do here and to look deep to heal these attitudes, to heal the relationships and to open to serve others from a space of open-heartedness and let that be a place of deep sincerity. So if we start choosing a perception of the world that mirrors the inner state we want to create, we start to enter a field of looking through, at first, the conditioned mind into a deeper truth, to our deepest wisdom. You think about that for a moment. Think about how many unshed tears, undelivered communications, suppressed anger or fear that still live somewhere in you. Those moments we never did quite find the resolution or experience the meaning and the purpose of our suffering or really embrace the understanding of someone else's story, their story whose grief we still carry. Those unhealed states still float through us and are triggered still or numbed into a silence somewhere in our being. 
And when we soul search for that meaning, the only one that can find it is you. None of these talks will really awaken that in you, um, but it is an encouragement. I stand by as a coach to spiritually support you in your own discoveries to find what the meaning is for you because that's the only way it'll make a difference. You'll find your way spiritually through your evolving consciousness, guaranteed. So, as I said, we're currently experiencing a variety of concerns. And as we sit together this morning, what has your attention? And how do you find that deeper meaning? We know that there is a foundational truth that within each of us is a wholeness, a unity. But we're continually thrown into the questions of what is my belief here on what is unfolding. Beliefs are beliefs, but truth is truth. So we want to recognize that when we share our feelings on Facebook. If we turned more to sharing truth on Facebook, a deep truth, a solid truth, a truth that heals all people, there would be a lot less uh, comments. There would just be a sense of stillness, understanding, acceptance, so truth over belief. This, so there's a, um, an opportunity here to look at what your beliefs are and what is unfolding and see where there's a disconnect that begins to form that division that at first might seem so innocuous until all of a sudden we're standing on different sides, shouting at each other, giving each other the cold shoulder, whatever. But we're still trying to claim a truth that unites us here. But whose truth? It has to be the one truth. Parker Palmer was one of the authors that Andrea wanted me to base my talk on. And he said, when suffering becomes so intense that we're focused to examine a deeper dimension of our condition and consider sources of insight that may have seemed uncouth when we in our world were humming with power and success. He goes on to say, now we know a solid foundational truth that is within each of us, this wholeness, this unity. But unfortunately, we continue to throw ourselves into those questions of what is my belief here? What is unfolding? And this disconnect continues to form a division. And at first, again, it might have seemed just not harming anything at all, but notice that it is truly just like the abbot said, it is grist for your mill and it is trying to allow you to find that deep truth that will unite you to your wholeness again. So I connect that with the idea that this is also Black History Month. And I find that that's an important time to, to really sit back and hear stories that maybe we just allowed to uh, float by us without really engaging in the truth. And I watched this TV series called For Life, and it's portraying the legal drama of Isaac Wright Jr., who was put in prison unjustly to serve his life sentence, and how he ultimately became a lawyer within the system and was able to overturn his convictions as well as becoming the advocate for his fellow inmates and all of their legal battles. So the actor himself, Nicholas Pinnock, plays the role, and he calls himself in the series Aaron Wallace, but it's still portraying Isaac Wright Jr.'s story. And it's a true story, and it's profiled in the image of this gentleman. Now this season, the character is out of prison, and so they're using this time they're using this time, it's so brilliant, to bring up the st stories of our current times, the issues that are before us right now. And it is a portrayal of events that invites each of us to see more deeply into the powerful movement of Black Lives Matter. From a walk in their shoes. I can't explain it any better than that, because when I watched this last, uh, a Monday or Tuesday when I was watching the, the show, I became the daughter carrying the Black Lives Matter poster. 
I stood with the group. I found myself just really engaged in the story in such a personal way. I stood with the signs that said, I can't breathe. I sat with the tears of, of the daughter as a young mother, questioning why she brought her new baby into such a cruel and threatening world. And what stirred the most in me was the scene. This is the most touching moment. Two older men, the two fathers, sitting at the, at the porch steps, asking one another, when was it for you that you discovered this world is not a safe place to be black? And they shared, I was seven, or I was eight. And that struck me to the core. I don't remember being threatened in that way at such a young age by the color of my skin. So I spent some time asking myself, when was it for me that I really understood, that I really was grasping this idea of civil rights? When, in all of my whiteness, was I really paying attention? And I grew up in a community of diversity, and I had four particular friends of color, Walter, James, Clarence, and Faye, and they live in me today, which is so interesting because I don't remember a lot of my other friends. I remember Mary Jean, and I remember a girl named Victoria. But these four, they come up all the time, in my, um, in my memory, and I was only five, six years old as we had classes together for, for three years. And we used to sit and compare our skin texture, and we used to be amused of the similarity of our palms when we would flip our hands. And we used to look at the sharp contrast of Faye's dark curly hair and my thin, straight blonde hair. And we would exchange drawings that we did. And as fickle as I was, one week I was either James's girlfriend or Clarence's the next or Walter's on occasion. We were all so carefree. But when did that change? When did it change? Where did they go? Where did I go? I only remember their first names, and I can't find them to this day. But they're still living inside of me. So back to the story portrayed in the series, when did I fear my own children were living in a dangerous world? And I don't think it was, you know, besides the little falling out of trees or running into a street, those things that, that uh, are burning themselves on a stove, those kinds of ooh, that near misses. It was when, when the world did it seem dangerous for my kids, and I don't think it was until they were in their teens that I worried about the draft being reinstated, and I would have to send them both to a destiny of uncertainty. So Valerie Kaur is a spiritual social activist. She's a Sikh woman who is a, a lawyer in the Bay Area. And she shares her fears with, with raw emotion and impact. And she tells the story as she cradles her sweet babies and that same question, how can I protect them from racism in this country? So she started a movement. It's called Revolutionary Love. You can look that up, Revolutionary Love on the internet. It's a, it's a powerful site to share. And in her project, they envision, here's their statement, a world where love is a public ethic and a shared practice in lives and politics. They generate stories and tools of thought and leadership to help equip people to practice the ethic of love in the fight for social justice. So how do we start here? We start by learning to share our stories to honor the lives of those in history that made a difference. Valerie reminds us that within each of us resides the voice of wisdom, the voice of self-compassion, compassion, but learning to summit it takes intentional practice. We need to get in tuned to what is in within us to teach us and give us the permission to dispel our inner not enoughness, 
She boldly asks us to imagine all of us as a critical mass being led by our deepest wisdoms. Perhaps that is how we take humanity across the threshold. Very, very powerful woman. So I, I thought, well, what are some of the, the stories that are in the um, history of um, black history? And I came across this one. And it was Claudette Colvin. I wonder if anybody of you have ever heard of her. But you, I know you've heard of Rosa Parks. And most people think of Rosa Parks as the first person to refuse to give up their seat on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. But there were actual several women who came before her, her and one of them was Claudette Colvin on March 2nd, 1955. When the 15 year old, 15 year old schoolgirl refused to move to the back of the bus. That was nine months before Rosa Parco's stand that launched that Montgomery bus boycott. Claudette had been studying the black leaders like Harriet Tubin and her segregated school. Those conversations had led to discussions around the current day at uh, Jim Crow laws that were, they were all experiencing. So when that bus driver ordered Claudette to get up and she refused, she said, it was like Sojourner Truth was on one side pushing me down and Harriet Tubman was on the other side of me pushing me down and I could not get up. And so that led me to a curiosity of who was Sojourner Truth. And they describe her as the definition of courage. The prominent abolitionist who was born into slavery and suffered the loss of at least three of her children being sold. Escaping slavery, Truth turned to the evangelical religion and became involved in moral reform and the abolitionist work. She collected supplies for the black regiments during the Civil War, advocated for formerly enslaved people during the Reconstruction period, and she was also an unapologetic women's rights activist. So those two inspiring women were who inspired Claudette to take a stand on that day. And of course her story goes on, she was arrested for that, but she was eventually, the case was overturned. And she was integral in a lot of the events that helped in that civil rights movement at that time. The struggle to end segregation was, was touched and fought by a lot of young people at that time. So I bow to her today. For, for that courage and that wisdom and that I get to speak her story here today. Now here's another one that's very relevant in our times as we talk about immunization, the vaxxers or the no vaxxers. And uh, this story was, was so endearing to me because inoculation was first introduced to America by a slave. And few details are known about the birth of Onesimus, Onesimus but it is assumed that he was born in Africa in the late 17th century before eventually landing in Boston. Now he was one of a thousand people of the African descent living in the Massachusetts colonies. He was the gift to a Puritan church minister, Cotton Mather, from his congregation. 1706 is the year I'm talking about. Onesimus told Mather about the centuries of old tradition of inoculation practice in Africa. By extracting material from an infected person and scratching it onto the skin of an uninfected person, you could deliberately introduce smallpox to the healthy one, making them immune. Considered extremely dangerous, Cotton Mather convinced the doctor to experiment with the procedure when a smallpox epidemic hit Boston in 1721. 240 people were inoculated. Opposed politically, religiously, and medically in the U.S. and abroad, public reaction to the experiment, but Mather and the others lived in, a, in that danger despite the records. Only 2% of the patients requesting the inoculation died compared to 15% who were not and who had contacted smallpox. So in, in that time period, here was a brave man 
that stood up for a truth and a, and a custom from his country that brought great healing from that moment forth. Now I want to move to another uh, idea that came up through my, through my research, and this was the earliest record recorded protest against slavery was done by the Quakers in 1688. Now they were, they were uh, known as the Society of Friends and they're still called the Friends here in, in our local community. And it was those friends when they saw the slave trade as a grave injustice against their fellow man and they used the golden rule. You see, when I pointed to find the truth, you go to the truth that serves all people. This golden rule, re regardless of skin color, they were against any inhumane treatment. We should do unto others as we would have done unto ourselves. Pray, they say, what thing in the world can be done worse towards us than if men would rob or steal us away and sell us as slaves to a strange country. Their protest against slavery and human trafficking was presented in Philadelphia, and their story continues on from there. So another practice that the Quakers are known for, the friends, silence. They spend moments of deep silence to appreciate that these, these truths will emerge and be the answer that brings back wholeness and unity. So it circles back to that. So as I close this, just that was just a, a little thumbnail scratch of some stories of, of the black history that influence us today. And I invite you to really explore how many of these unhealed fragments are in the abyss of despair inside of you, that invisible place where you have unknowingly just stored the unbearable and the unimaginable. Take the courage in the stillness of your practice to be with the presence to be with your truth, to confront the conflicts that we're seeing in the stories that are passing us by, just like the abbot told his monks, how to feel safe in an unsafe world. The stories and the challenges of the other are here for our ears to hear. Remember the CSL vision statement, we envision humanity awakening to its spiritual magnificence, discovering the creative power of our thought, to practice that. So my time, is, my time is closing here, but I wanted to remind you in the science of mind, when you're in thought, when you're in contemplation, when you're in your imagination, when you're in that inward feeling, that is when we're consciously turning to our source. And there is a divine pattern within each of us, as Ernest Holmes' words, that is springing forth into a new manifestation. Prayer and treatment, Ernest Holmes said, opens up avenues of thought, expands our consciousness, and lets this reality through. It clarifies the mentality and removes the obstructions of our thoughts and lets in the light. And one of our current day philosophers, Arashante, enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with becoming better or being happier. Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. It's seen through the facade of pretense. It is the complete eradication of everything we imagined to be true. Meister Eckhart, be willing to be a beginner every single morning. So we take a breath on this beautiful day. As Judy plays the keys of the piano, the keys to your heart, may some of these stories awaken and quicken in you a deeper understanding of what was and maybe something you never saw or heard before. That in a heart of humility, we are graced with a deeper understanding of what is true here. Another's intel to take you into this moment, create space in your mind. Whenever 
you find yourself thinking that you are right, step back. Allow your mind to expand. For the moment, assume that others understand why you believe what you believe and still choose to believe differently and see if you can truly understand why they believe the way they do. Why? Create space in your heart. When the pain of life fills you completely, open your heart a little more. Pain tries to close the heart, fear locks it closed. When you open up, fear cannot fill you, for there are no walls to hold it. As we meditate on these thoughts, we feel the expansion. We tap in to the heart field of our knowing. We breathe there. We breathe there where the door of our heart stays wide open. In all the moments we sang into our heart, wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once, come to me, this greater understanding, these revelations, these truths, come to me, come to me, awaken in me, inspire me, improve me, allow me to let go of what no longer serves humanity. Let me let go of the stale, stagnant thoughts that are causing some of this confusion. As I reach back and I find all through history, the stories have been knocking on the door of my heart to awaken me to the greater idea. I know this truth for myself and I know this truth for you. As we take the leading role in being the master and answering our own questions, what is in this for me? What is here for me to know? And there, we recognize a deep level of forgiveness. As Jesus said, forgive them, they know not what they do. Forgive us, we know not what we do. Awaken us to know. I release this prayer knowing that the divine wholeness infuses every single one of us hand in hand heart to heart we find our way that's what a community does we are evolving no doubt in that thank you god and so it is thank you everyone charlie thank you reverend sue that was very inspiring and and i learned a lot <laughs> so I do want to uh, remind everyone that we do have our drive through next Sunday for the Valentine's Day. We also <clears throat> have the Greg Lavoy workshop coming up, so you can check that out. But I just want to uh, mention that if you feel inspired to support our center, which we would love, you can go to our website, and, and there's ways to donate that way or you can do the old-fashioned way, you can mail a check-in. <laughs> but we do appreciate your support. <clears throat> we are carrying on with our classes and maintaining our office and doing a lot of good work at this point <clears throat> in time, and we will be opening very, very soon, and you'll hear more details about that next week, um, during the week. <clears throat> So we do appreciate your gifts and thank you, thank you so much. But I do want to do our offertory affirmation and if in the silence of your own home or you can do it out loud, <clears throat> you can repeat after me. Gratefully I give with an attitude of abundance for I know as I give, I do receive and so it is. So I would like to close today's service with more music from Dalton. And thank you, Judy, for being here and support with the piano. And uh, then Reverend Sue and I will come up at the end of the song. All right, if you guys could stand up wherever you are, stretch yourselves out. Maybe give some thought to the uh, 
the quote from Viktor Frankl about having the power to, to choose our attitudes. And choose heaven with me now. I'm choosing heaven today. Oh, I'm choosing heaven today. Hey, I am walking the road of heaven right now. Singing, I'm choosing heaven today. Oh, I'm choosing heaven today. I'm choosing heaven today. Hey, I am walking the road heaven right now singing I'm choosing heaven heaven with me one more time I'm choosing heaven today oh I'm choosing heaven today hey, I am walking the road of heaven right now singing I'm choosing heaven I'm choosing love I'm choosing love today oh I'm choosing love today. Hey, I am walking the road of love right now Singing I'm choosing love I choose compassion I choose compassion today Oh, I choose compassion today hey, I am walking the road of compassion right now Singing I choose compassion Joy now, joy I'm choosing joy today Oh, I'm choosing joy today. Hey, I am walking the road of joy right now. Singing, I'm choosing joy in heaven one more time now. I'm choosing heaven today. Oh, I'm choosing heaven today. Hey, I am walking the road of heaven right now. Singing, I'm choosing heaven today. Yes, I am walking. Awesome. That's the best song for this ending this service. I want to um, dedicate that service to Faye, to Clarence, to Walter, and to James. And may what we learn together in, our, in those early years still live and breathe in us. And may it inspire us to be in a world that works for all. And so I, I want to release with that knowing, and Charlie's going to share an affirmation for you to take in during your week. I am open to the promise of a clean slate, which every moment holds. Yeah. So we'll do it one more time. I am open to the promise of a clean slate, which every moment holds. And so it is. Have so a beautiful week. Have a great day. <laughs>